My name is Donna McKay. I'm the Executive Director at Physicians for Human Rights. We're really glad that you're tuning in as we come together to discuss the roles of nurses, doctors, and other health professionals who are on the front lines of the battle against this unprecedented pandemic, COVID-19, a virus that has no boundaries. Healthcare workers everywhere are putting themselves at great risk to provide life-saving care and many are being forced to wage this fight without the proper PPE or personal protective equipment. They need to keep themselves, their patients, and their families safe. Just yesterday, we learned about the COVID-19 death of Caius Kelly, a 48-year-old nurse manager in New York City. A nurse who worked with Mr. Kelly told the New York Times that the hospital had offered nurses one classic protective gown for an entire shift. The normal protocol requires a change of gowns between interactions with every infected patient. So while Mr. Kelly was likely the first nurse in New York City to die of COVID-19, he certainly will not be the last. Without PPE, health workers need and deserve the situation will only become more dire in the weeks and in the months ahead. The situation that health workers find themselves in is untenable and unacceptable. Alongside our partners, we at PHR are calling for concerted action at the local, national, global levels to immediately address the PPE shortages and provide health workers with the support that they need. This is particularly critical in low resource settings and in countries that are in conflict where already weak health systems are overstretched and um, where they've experienced violent attacks. We know, for example, in Kenya, where PHR has an office that no protective gear has been provided for community health workers and volunteers who are on the front lines, and they're mostly women. Um, so look, there's still much about the contours of this virus that we don't know, but here's what is abundantly clear. If we don't protect our healthcare workers, the system will completely collapse. So I'm thankful that we have two remarkable physicians joining us today for a timely and urgent discussion on the needs for PPE and what it's like working on the front lines of the pandemic and how we can support their efforts. So with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Renit Mashuri, who's PHR's senior medical advisor. Dr. Mashuri is also a professor of family medicine at Georgetown University School of Medicine and is a practicing family physician in Washington, DC. So Renit, I'm going to put myself on mute now and turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, and hello, everybody. I think there is about a 600 of you, 600 strong. So thank you so much for your interest and for joining us today. Um, so at this point, everybody is well aware that we are in the midst of an unprecedented global health crisis. It's an emergency, unlike anything we've faced in the US or around the world. And the coronavirus, which causes COVID-19, has permeated the borders of almost every country. Now, more than ever, we need strong leadership. We need science-driven policies and sustained support for the healthcare workers on the front lines everywhere of this pandemic response. You will see no better example of the kind of ingenuity, compassion, and leadership that this moment requires in the nurses, doctors, and other healthcare workers and first responders working all over the place to provide care for those who are affected, both in the US and internationally. The brave individuals um, have put their own health and safety at risk by doing so. But their ability to provide care, as well as their ability to protect themselves, their patients and their own families, depends on the availability, as Donna was saying, of personal protective equipment or PPE and other critical supplies. Very disturbingly, healthcare workers around the US and across the globe are sounding the alarm, reporting a desperate shortage of protective supplies. We've heard jaw-dropping stories from healthcare workers forced to reuse PPE severely rationed supplies and resort to using anything from trash bags to bandanas and hand-sewn masks and even Halloween costumes. Here in Washington DC where I am, the situation is no different. We received a memo just the other day from the DC Department of Health with instructions to conserve protective equipment and we were asked by local health leaders to limit our use to only one mask for an entire day, unless it was visibly soiled. A colleague of mine working at a safety net here, um, the clinic in the city wrote, we have come to a point where we're crowdsourcing for supplies. We need PPE and cleaning products. We will gladly accept donations. 
The CDC has said that PPE manufacturers are experiencing an exponential increase in orders and are facing challenges in meeting those demands. Similarly, lawmakers and governors have expressed concerns that their request for supplies from the strategic national stockpile are not being filled. In response, the CDC has encouraged healthcare facilities to implement strategies to conserve supplies, which is exactly what we're seeing here in DC and elsewhere. The CDC also recently loosened their recommendations on face protection, saying that looser fitting surgical masks are quote, an acceptable alter alternative and even saying that it is okay to use bandanas and scarves. This is a dangerous and honestly unacceptable suggestion that fails to address the severe PPE shortage and is already forcing health workers to make impossible decisions and further jeopardizing their own lives and the lives of, of those they care for. Private companies, community groups, and individuals are coming forward to donate supplies. Well, this is very admirable. This is not a sustainable or appropriate solution. Groups of medical providers have formed new initiatives like Get Us PPE to get PPE to where it's needed the most. And even here, a shout out to our, some of our intrepid medical students at Georgetown, several of whom are active in PHR and whose clerkships are on hold. They have organized a global drive for hospital supplies called Med Supply Drive. And, and even Beto O'Rourke was impressed enough to tweet their appeal. So there's no sugarcoating it. This is an emergency. We clearly need to mobilize all levels of government and the private sector in a coordinated and really urgent collaboration to ensure that health and medical resources like PPE are swiftly and properly distributed. PHR is lending its voice and platforms to demand PPE for those who need it in the US and around the world. We have a petition to the Trump administration on our website, phr.org, that I recommend everyone on this call sign on to. So um, while PHR and our partners push for action, today we are so privileged to hear from someone who knows these challenges all too well and who is using his skills and voice to save lives and advocate for forcefully for PPE. I'm so pleased to be joined here <clears throat> by Dr. Joshua Lerner, an attending emergency department physician at the University of Massachusetts Memorial Health Alliance Clinton Hospital. It's a, it's a mouthful. Um, many of you may have seen that last week, Dr. Lerner wrote a Facebook post that went viral he was demanding that the US government address the national PPE shortage by providing frontline health workers with the gloves, masks, and 95 respirators and gowns that they so desperately need. Dr. Lerner, or Josh, as I will, I hope it's okay to call you that Absolutely. for the rest of the uh, webinar. He has sin since taken his advocacy for those working on the front lines of the pandemic to the national press, and he has appeared in a media ranging from Good Morning America to Scientific American. Josh, as you so eloquently wrote, sending healthcare workers to the front line, asking them to cover their face with a bandana is akin to sending a soldier to the front line in a t-shirt and flip-flops. I don't want to talk. I don't want assurances. I want action. So Dr. Lerner or Josh, on behalf of Physicians for Human Rights, thank you so much for joining us today and for everything that you do. And um, I just, I know that you came here, you, sh you showed up about half an hour ago, fresh yep. off your shift in the emergency room. Yep. Can you tell us what it was like there today? So um, where I work is um, not feeling the same effects that I think we're all reading about in the news in New York City and um, Washington State, but I think it's coming. Um, today was probably the busiest shift in terms of volume that we've had um, in, in a while, probably in the last week to 10 days. Um, because what you had been seeing was what I sort of had referred to as the calm before the storm, where people were doing the appropriate social distancing, trying to avoid you know, going to the ER for, for, for non-emergencies. And so our total patient volume was down, um, though we were starting to see over the past few days the acute respiratory cases um, that are presumed COVID. I mean, one of the problems we have is that testing takes a few days to come back. So, um, you know, we don't know right away whether or not a patient is COVID. 
But today in the ER was really the first day that I think our volume had returned along with a lot of the uh, sort of acuity, particularly from the respiratory side um, that you see with, with this pandemic. So this is what we uh, call the surge. We're seeing the surge in a few other cities like Detroit, Michigan, and in uh, New Orleans and other places. Is that what you think is happening and is coming to your emergency department? Absolutely. I think um, I had, you know, I think a lot of people in, in my field or sort of around me had been saying sort of last week, like, oh, it's going to be these next couple weeks. And sure enough, towards the end of this week, and, and certainly I'm sure carrying into next week, um, we are going to see that surge. Absolutely. What do you think the, um, the effects of the surge are going to be on uh, protective equipment? So unfortunately, um, you know, today was actually the first day of working or first shift working where we did not have the traditional um, 3M N95 mask that we normally had been using, um, which has a sort of a green sort of front to it. Um, we did have N95 respirator masks um, still, but it was a different company, different sort of version, I guess you could say. And so it's obviously concerning that just as the surge is coming, we've already dwindled our supplies um, to sort of now be sort of having to scrounge for um, particularly the N95 mask, but, but for, 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 for PPE, um, you know, in light of, you know, the, the, the wave of patients that's expected to be coming now. Mm -hmm. And in terms of who has access to it, is there a difference between the doctors and the nurses and the techs or the respiratory um, technicians, or is everybody basically using um, the same the same type same type of PPE? Everybody's pretty much using the same stuff. Which I mean, you know, we're all on the same team. We're all doing the same same work. So um, it's not like it's rationed differently. I would say um, we do have special uh, face masks that we use for when we're intubating a patient. So when we're going getting up close and personal to to put someone on a ventilator, put a breathing tube, and put them on the ventilator. As the emergency physician doing that procedure, I, I would wear a, a slightly different face shield um, just because I'm sort of right up over the patient. But other than that, everything else is, is completely shared and um, spread amongst us equally. Great. I want to go back to that Facebook post that made you famous and, as you said, made you go viral, um, but not the corona type <laughs> viral, a much better type of viral. Um, so it was so poignant and, and powerful. Why do you think your post resonated so widely with so many people, clinicians and non-clinicians? Yeah, I think um, it's funny. People have, have called and referred to it as an essay and they've referred to it as a, as a letter. And it, when I wrote it, it was sort of just almost like a, a stream of, of emotion um, having read about the CDC sort of loosening guidelines. And so I think, I mean, it did, I think it really touched a nerve with a lot of healthcare workers who were feeling abandoned or who were feeling like they were being left sort of to their own devices, really, to, to sort of fight this really a battle, you know, alone. Um, and so much of the, the feedback I got, you know, was from healthcare workers thanking each other and just saying, you know, we're in this together. And so I think it really struck a nerve with um, the whole healthcare community about um, one, sticking up for each other, but then two, this otherwise, you know, this, this anxiety of, of like, oh my goodness, are we going to be left, left alone or abandoned? And so this was a response from your colleagues. What, what about the wider response um, that you received after your post? Can you tell us a little yeah, bit more about the, that? The, the response has been amazing, um, both, both on Facebook and just even sort of we see in the community. So for example, um, the following day, people were showing up in our ER, showing up to our ER, donating stuff, donating food here, you know, um, uh, local restaurants brought, you know, brought us pizza and food for lunch. Um, people started hand sewing masks without even asking. Um, a day or so after that shift, I was working another shift in the evening and, and we had, we fielded a phone call from someone who, who was just calling. Their only question was what material would be best to sew a mask out of. And so that was just really touching. So um, it sounds like sort of on the, uh, in terms of your, your, 
colleagues and even people who are not necessarily in, in the healthcare business, this is this certainly touched a nerve. What about um, people in leadership position? Um, was there a sense that um, you know this is all happening to them and we are not, um, or or do you get a sense that um, those in leadership position, whether in your hospital or elsewhere, are feeling the same um, sense of urgency about this? I mean, I think. Uh, you know, I'm just re reading the news, you know, uh, reading sort of over the last week and, 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 and so forth. I think, I, I don't think that, that politicians or our political leaders necessarily feel that same urgency. Um, I think that our hospital and, and many hospitals have, have tried their best to, to, you know, sort of support us. Um, we have a, an incident command center now set up in my hospital. Um, you know, I, I think in my post I had sort of pled for um, administrators to come down into the ER and, and sort of help us. And, and, and today that was the case. Um, we, we had a lot of hands in the ER, so that was great to see. Um, so, you know, I think the outpouring of support from the community has been just amazing. Um, the outpouring on Facebook, I've had people contact me saying, you know, they, they won uh, an eBay uh, bid for, for a box of masks and they wanted to mail it to me. Um, and, you know, wh where could I mail it? Where could I send that? Um, and so the, the, the community has really, I think, rallied the community, both our local community, but I think the community in this country has, has rallied as a whole around healthcare workers, which I think goes a long way for, for us to, to, to go to work every day um, under these circumstances. What about your family? Were, I'm sure your parents read this and um, did they just freak out even more knowing what actually happens in your emergency room? Yeah, I think um, my parents, I'm, my wife and I are the only people in healthcare in, in, in either of our families. So um, we always joke that, you know, we can talk to each other about things and, and nothing, nothing surprises us, but everything will surprise the rest of our families. And, and, and my family was definitely surprised to hear about this. They, you know, people can't believe that in America that we, you know, you see pictures of people wearing garbage bags in the hospital. Um, they can't believe it. Um, hopefully they're not too worried. Um, you know, I, they, I know they, they're worried a little bit. They um, are older. They, they fall into, I'm more worried for them, I think. They fall into the demographic that, that would potentially be at much higher risk. Um, but yeah, my, my wife and I, um, you know, we, we talk about it a lot. We, we take a lot of precautions um, in our home um, to sort of make sure that we don't pass it to our children or, or to, to anyone else. So tell us a little bit about that. What happens when you end your shift and um, you come home? I know that many of my colleagues and I have designed all kinds of different ways of disposing of our clothing. Um, so what's your, what's your secret? My, my routine, yeah. So um, this is the first time I've been in attending for, for 10 years, you know, before that I was in residency. This is the first time I, ch I change at the hospital. So I, I, at the end of my shift, um, we have a little changing room. I bring a clean set of clothes. I take my, my scrubs, they go into a plastic bag in my, in my sort of in a, like a gym bag, they go into a plastic bag and I change into to clean clothes. Um, I come home, um, we have a, a COVID car, I guess you could say. So instead of taking my car, or my wife taking her car, we're taking the same, you know, one car uh, to work. Um, that's the COVID car, I guess. Um, and um, when I come in, we, I, yeah, I come in the, through the basement now. We have a basement entrance. I come in through the basement, take off my shoes, um, you know, take my bag of uh, the, the dirty scrubs that goes straight into the washing machine. Um, and then the clothes even that I wore home in the COVID mobile, uh, that goes into the, um, into the washing machine too. And then I immediately shower, which is what I would do anyway when I came home from work. But, um, you know, really try to get everything you know i spray my glasses um with uh like a cleaner um just to, again as a, as a potential source um spray my phone I, I make sure my phone's clean everything you know everything is sort of almost like getting into a, a sterile uh, a field if you will the bubble boy yeah right exactly <laughs> Um, so you spoke now and you also wrote very elegantly about the need to protect not just yourself or your family but also your what you said you called your healthcare family. Can you tell us a little bit about how the how the morale is the, among your healthcare family and right now? Well, everyone in my ER thinks it's pretty cool that I was on uh, TV. So that, uh, <laughs> um, but no, it's serious, it's seriously. I, I think 
the ER particular, I think all of medicine is one big family. And I think the ER, we are sort of a, a close knit group as well, just because we work alongside each other so much. Um, I know in my ER, there's, you know, everyone feels the pressure. There's no, there's no question about, um, you know, feeling some anxiety or feeling some, um, maybe even a, a certain degree of discomfort. Um, but I think as a whole, um, particularly in, in my ER that, um, you know, we are a close knit group and we definitely support each other. And so I think the morale is, I think we look at it as this is, you know, this is a job for us to do. This is our challenge and, and we're ready to rise up for it. So you're calling it a, a job in, in, in your writing and your post, you actually gave a different analogy is uh, not that it's an analogy because this is your job, but um, you are saying that we are at war. Healthcare workers are your soldiers and the war has just begun. Can you expand a little bit more on this and how you see the need for a warlike whole of society response to this uh, pandemic? Sure, absolutely. I mean, first of all, I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to say I, I support war in any way, of course, but I think we need to view this pandemic in the way that at least in generations past we have viewed um, you know, the, the, the world wars in the sense that we as a nation need to come together as, as, a, as a nation to, to really tackle this. This is not um, an obstacle for one segment of the population. This is not a, 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 an obstacle for just healthcare workers. This is a truly both global crisis, but also just a crisis for us in, in this country. And I think we need to approach it like that, um, you know, I, when I see things about, you know, um, people um, disagreeing or about the, the needs for, for certain, uh, whether it's social distancing and so forth, or even questioning the severity of what is going on, um, that, that sort of disunity, I think, is, is what weakens our, our fight against this. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned already, of some really touching stories about people coming and, and dropping off stuff in at the outside your emergency room, we hear about so many citizen groups and medical students and fashion houses, even car manufacturers who are trying to help with PPE and other medical supplies and getting them to healthcare facilities. Is that the solution? Um, who's, who's responsible ultimately to provide us, all of us, all the healthcare workers um, with PPE and supplies? I mean, I think, first of all, I would never say anything negative about people who want to sew masks. Um, that is, again, a heartfelt, um, sincere desire to help us. There's literature, believe it or not, I didn't, I didn't know this until a week ago, but there is literature about the usefulness of things such as bandanas and stuff for protection. So to be honest, I don't know how, how much a, a hand-sewn face mask will, will offer me in terms of, of, of PPE protection. But I think at the same time, it, it's, it's almost like having a victory garden, um, you know, it, as, to make a, a war metaphor or reference in that it shows that, that we are doing something together. Um, we do wear the, the hand-sewn um, uh, masks that people have made. We put them over our N95s um, to sort of shield them a little bit, again, because they, as you had mentioned, um, you know, to, to, because they're we're gonna get rid of the N95s if they're grossly contaminated. And so the hand-sewn masks can at least offer us some protection to prevent that N95 mask from becoming grossly contaminated. Um, you know, but I think the, you know, our, our strength certainly comes from the community, but I think we need the strength of, of our society as a whole, um, whether that be government or our institutions, or our government institutions, um, whether that be sort of the, the private industry, the, the largest, the private institutions, um, we need sort of a, an organized um, help um, that, that comes from, from institutions, not from necessarily the individual. Thank you so, so, so much. I think um, at this point, we are going to go to some questions from um, some of our audience members. And so um, uh, the first question I'm gonna go to is from Kathy in California. And she says that she's charged with developing protocols to offer psychological support to frontline workers who will be on triage teams. 
And she wants to know, number one, what kinds of, what kind of support do you think hospital systems need to offer people who will make decisions about who will and will not get ventilators or get beds? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one in terms of, of rationing. And, and we've heard about what's going on in Italy um, and, and that happening there. I think the biggest thing would be to, to reinforce to, to the individuals or the healthcare worker making those tough decisions that it is a impossible decision. There's no, it, it's, it, they should not feel, I, I think as a healthcare worker, you, you would feel guilty about having to make decisions like that. And, and it's understandable. And I think the kind of support that, that someone making those decisions would need would, would be just really the support that, that they were doing the best they could in a time of obviously great strife. Um, you know, there really was no better decision. Um, and so I think, you know, I think support groups uh, for multiple individuals, whether, you know, uh, to, to, who could group together to sort of discuss those issues, but then just sort of that sort of type of individual support to the individual who, who is making what is a decision that nobody wants to make, no healthcare worker would ever want to make. Yeah, I think a, a study came out just today um, from China looking at the mental health effects of, um, of being a frontline health professional in Wuhan. And they noted that um, more women, more people who were in the hot spots and other health professionals who are dealing directly with COVID-19 patients had shown higher rates of uh, depression and anxiety and other mental health issues. Is that something that you see in your hospital or is that something that you have concerns for for the, our, our larger community? I think so. I think particularly looking at how long this pandemic could stretch on, um, you're talking about chronic stress, daily chronic stress um, of both being in harm's way perhaps, of both being sort of under-resourced or not having the resources and then as the, as the writer, as the, as the, the person had, had mentioned, making these very difficult decisions, these sort of, these ethically or morally complicated decisions, um, really the, those, those things all compound and really can lead certainly to, um, you know, feelings of depression and, and feelings of, you know, uh, perhaps self-doubt. Um, so I think, I think sort of certainly long-term um, uh, having mental health resources, uh, you know, will be very important. I actually, one of my longtime friends from high school um, is a mental health counselor now, and she had thanked me on my, when this post had gone viral, and I had responded to her that, you know, I, I thanked her. I said, I think in, in this time, I can't think of anything more important than mental health care, um, because she's doing her part as well. So, um, yeah, I think um, mental health care, particularly for, for the health care, for health care workers, and then for all people who are you know, there's going to be a lot of loss um, is going to be very important. And I mean, this um, pandemic has put people and especially patients and their families in unimaginable situations where their loved one is going off to the ER and the next thing happens, they go to the ICU and then they die alone or your spouse is pregnant and she's going, she has to go to the hospital by herself to deliver the baby and it's not allowed for the spouse to be there or any other family members. I mean, these are heartbreaking uh, situations for patients. How, what is the effect on, on the providers, on the health workers who work with uh, in those situations as well? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you hear about those stories, it's incredibly um, tragic. Um, I think one of the things I love about medicine is being at the bedside and, and holding someone's hand. Um, I think, you know, uh, that's a, an amazing thing, particularly if someone is otherwise alone. Um, but it is, it's very, it's very hard. I, you know, it's, um, I can't imagine being alone in, in times of crisis. And I think that's why we talk about our healthcare family, because we, we feel like when we're at work or with our family, um, but yeah, I think um, that is a that is a, a very very tragic thing. Have you seen any of these kinds of goodbyes said in your emergency room? We we do have. I mean, we do limit the visitors currently. Um, that said, I, I I personally would always want to try to make an exception, um, particularly in cases of sort of end of life and and, and death um, for family members. Um, but. Um, you know, it, it's obviously challenging. You want to sort of weigh that with sort of the, the population health. Um, you know, we try to limit if 
their small children with families and so you know to as in terms of coming in um um with with other family members so I, I can't say I've seen it directly related to COVID um, at this point, though up in our ICU, there is a zero visit. My understanding is there's a zero visitor policy. Um, and so, yeah, people who are up there are, are on their own. I, I'm going to take another question from Julia in Washington. Um, she notes that many people are sewing handmade face masks and donating them to hospitals. And um, we already touched upon it. Um, so what can you say about whether those are sufficient or appropriate to use um, under any circumstances and especially under the current circumstances? So, so first of all, anyone who has taken the time to, to hand sew a mask, I am very grateful. I, I think it, it gives us strength, even if it doesn't necessarily give us the protection that we need. Um, so there are some studies, believe it or not, um, you can go on Google Scholar um, and look them up, but there are studies comparing the use of things such as bandanas and cloth masks. And the effectiveness, unfortunately, when used alone, is that they are not effective and they do not provide us the protection that we need. Um, so, you know, I think it's indicative that we need more PPE. We need the, the institutions now, the individuals have stepped up, the people who are hand sewing masks have stepped up and offered to help us, but we need sort of a larger institutional push to get the, the appropriate um, uh, masks. I, referred, I keep referring to masks, I, I really mean the N95 respirator um, as a sort of a probably the most key component of the PPE that we wear. I was, uh, to, to expand on this, I was in a call um, last week with a few people who are experts in, um, in uh, medical supplies and um, work worker, health worker protections. And I, I asked a question, what should people do, people like you and others who are working in, in, their, in their facilities, in their health, um, in the hospitals, in the emergency departments, and they don't have adequate PPE for them for, for use? What is, what kind of recourse do they have? And um, one person said, well, they should complain to OSHA. And is that something that you had considered doing? Is that something that you have heard that um, any of your colleagues are considering doing? Clearly, the bandana, bandanas and, and, and scarves are not up to OSHA standards. Correct, yeah. Um, I have not personally ignored have I heard of anyone who has made complaints to OSHA. I, I would say that is certainly one avenue. I think another avenue is to speak to your Congress people um, and say, you know, let's stop bickering and trying to score political points and, and let's get our healthcare workers what they need, however that needs to get done. Um, so, you know, I read in the news, I, I read um, in the, the, the Boston Globe, I believe, that the, the, the governor of Massachusetts had actually had to bid against the federal government to obtain N95 masks, to obtain these, these important pieces of PPE. Again, as a healthcare worker on the front lines, that seems crazy to me. We're bidding against ourselves. That's not in any way being constructed. It's not ultimately getting us what we need. Um, and and our, the governor lost. The governor lost to the federal government who I guess had bid higher. That kind of you know, infighting or, or, or bidding against oneself helps, does not help us at all. Like it, it offers us nothing. Um, and so I would say we need, again, as a country to get all on the same page and say, we need to get this, get, get these supplies to the people who need them on the ground. I'm gonna take another question from Sarah in Illinois. Um, and um, she asks, what are your predictions for the months ahead, ahead in terms of PPE availability around the country? So um, my wife might actually joke, it is one of my favorite lines from the show Downton Abbey is to never mistake hope for certainty. Um, so I hope that in the coming weeks that we have enough PPE. Um, I, I don't know. I am not certain about that. Um, I, I do know I have read, you know, that there are manufacturing, manufacturing is, is hopefully starting to increase. I think I read in the news just the other day that, that 3M is going to be producing more masks. So that's obviously in, in completely welcomed. Um, that other companies are starting to look at how they can manufacture ventilators and so forth. Um, so I hope um, that in the coming weeks, when, when we will likely need more, we will likely need a larger supply of PPE, um, that, that it is there for us. 
One of the ironies of this crisis, I think, is that um, for the first time, I think many physicians and clinicians are feeling like we're in a, some sort of a developing country. Usually we go, I do a lot of global health and we go over and we bring supplies, you know, to Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia. And suddenly here we are and we are in a position where we're begging for supplies. Um, how does that, uh, you know, I know that I'm sure through medical school and residency, the issue of global health is just something that a lot of trainees and, and, and physicians are, are interested in. How does that feel to suddenly be on the sort of the, um, you know, we need your help kind of end of the story? I mean, it gives me, first of all, it gives me even that much more respect for the people who, who have gone, you know, who have gone to third world countries and, and have, have offered their their time and expertise in, in those areas. Um, yeah, I never thought I would be doing that. I, I, I to be honest, here in, in this country, um, that we would literally need to put out a call for people to, you know, bring up, bring in whatever you've got because we don't have any. Um, you know, uh, we have uh, N90, N95, is, as you had mentioned about OSHA, N95 is an OSHA standard, is, is my understanding. So, for example, contractors and painters have N95 masks, um, and, and we've been accepting donations from them because, again, we, we need them. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I never in my wildest dreams had thought that that would maybe hit home here in this country. Um, it has. And so, you know, I think we need to sort of wake up and, 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 and sort of change. Yeah, certainly a very sobering situation. Um, and we feel for all of our colleagues in the U.S. as well as our many colleagues um, in many other countries in conflict and non-conflict areas who are going to feel it very, very deeply in the coming weeks and months, but who also have been feeling this for a long, long time. So thank you so much, Josh. Is there anything else that you would like to tell um, our um, viewers? Um, Just want, uh, hopefully everyone stay safe. Hopefully we need you stay safe um, and uh, we you know, look out for each other. Thank you so much. We so appreciate having you here and I'm gonna send it back to Donna. Great, thank you. Josh and Renee, thank you so much. Um, I just want to close. First of all, I want to thank everyone for, for being a part of the call. And I, and I wanted to, I know there were a few references made to the worldwide pandemic. I wanted to just remind people that while the U.S. now has the most confirmed cases worldwide, it is clearly a global crisis. We have 3,400 Chinese health workers, an additional 2,600 um, health workers who've been infected in, Ital infected in Italy. And so this is a global problem and needs global solutions. Um, so, you know, as Renit said, we need to stand up to this worldwide challenge to protect people, especially where our healthcare workers um, are at great risk. And as Renit said, this is an emergency and we can do way, way better than this. Um, we need to mobilize public and private sectors in a coordinated and urgent collaboration with global counterparts in an alliance. And in the United States, we need our leadership, the Trump administration, to coordinate and to lead a national effort in partnership with state leaders, not bidding against them, as Josh pointed out, this is insane, or telling states that they're on their own. We cannot politicize the protection of health workers when so much is at stake. So I really thank all of you for coming together today. I hope you'll go to the website, sign the petition that Renit referenced before, share it on your social platform so that we can help carry the message of health professionals and follow PHR during the crisis. Um, and to every healthcare worker who is on the call today, we have your backs and we just admire what you are so bravely doing to provide care and we thank you and we will do all that we can on our end to um, to be your voice during this critical time. So thank you all for joining us and, um, and be safe. Thank you.